Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today on the importance of online presence in the local search ecosystem. I'm Chad Hill and I'm joined by Adam Stetzer and our team in New York. Yeah, hey Chad, good afternoon. Glad everybody could join us. We're really excited to be here. I'm Adam Stetzer up here in the Rochester, New York office. I have a room full of folks who are dying to say hello. Hello. Chad, we're really excited to learn about the local search ecosystem. Awesome. Well, today we have um, a guest speaker with us. We have Christian Ward, who is the EVP of Yex Partnerships. Um, Christian, uh, we spoke with him probably over about a year ago now when we first started looking into um, Yex and seeing how it could complement the services that, that we offer as part of our reseller program. And we wanted today to, to have um, Christian join us and sort of hear it firsthand, um, hear about Yex and the importance of the local, of local online presence. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Christian Ward. And Christian, you might just want to do a quick intro. I know you have some people in the team, on your team in, in the room with you there. Um, but uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Absolutely. Well, Chad, Adam, thank you so much. And thanks to HubShop for uh, putting this together. We, we love talking about uh, online presence, digital presence, and how important it is to small businesses. So we very much appreciate the opportunity. Um, also joining me here today is Nicole Medina, who uh, is our account manager that works very closely with the HubShot team to make sure that we're bringing the best service we can. Uh, and today we're going to work together through this uh, as uh, I just start from the beginning of. Um, with Yex, this is always a learning experience with us and our partners. Um, we love working with digital and professional media uh, individuals and agencies. Uh, to us, uh, as we go through this, if there are questions and things, you've got a, a panel there to your right in the uh, uh, WebEx or webinar uh, tool. Feel free to ask questions. I'll try and cover as much as I can. It's a lot of material, uh, but then again, it's, it's, it's not all that complex. Uh, what we're going to cover today is uh, we're going to go through agenda-wise. Let me see if this will update for me. It takes a second. There we are. So we're going to go through online presence. What is it? Why does it matter? Uh, we actually find with a lot of our professional marketer partners that it, it, it sometimes can be confusing to explain to a small business. So I'm going to give you a couple quick ways to explain it to them. We're going to talk about local search and how it works. It's definitely different than classic search. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what local search optimization is versus classic SEO uh, uh, from a, a, a data perspective. Uh, then we're going to talk about something that uh, is very near and dear to my heart, the local search ecosystem. Uh, what uh, some may know is, is uh, prior to working here at Yex, I was the chief data officer for uh, InfoGroup, which is one of the largest data aggregators in the United States. Uh, so I have sort of very good knowledge of how these, these ecosystems work uh, and happy to explain because if there's one thing about local search data, it's incredibly frustrating uh, when it changes all the time and people want to understand why. So we're going to go through that, and then we're going to talk a little bit about best practices. Uh, when you sell the product, when you utilize the product, what does it do, what does it not do, what are great ways to optimize it. So that's our agenda. Um, we'll get started here with online presence. So online presence, uh, we often discuss, and you hear people talk about presence, they talk about local listing management, they talk about um, uh, digital presence. All of these things are sometimes confusing and sometimes difficult to explain to uh, an SMB. Uh, other times you'll talk to an SMB who probably has a PhD in digital marketing and can probably correct you more than you could explain to them. Um, I love those people. They're amazing. Um, but generally speaking, when we explain what it is, is we try to explain it from the standpoint of what is offline presence. So just like the sign in front of your building uh, or a neon sign in front of a building, it's the, it's the information that is made available to the public or to consumers as they drive by a location, can they see who the business is? And what's fascinating about it is we call it sort of the, the broken floodlight theory. You know, how many days or how many hours would, a, would the owner of a small business or a small yogurt shop let a broken neon sign be on the side of their building? And you see them all the time. It's kind of amazing. Um, but a really well-run business will not let offline presence get in their way. And we explain online presence in a similar way. So for example, if I was the Brody Mart, or if I was uh, the beautiful town of Hillsdale, or perhaps uh, the Dynasty Buffet, and now my all-time favorite, the Elmhurst Hospital. Um, these are great examples of just how terrible uh, online pre uh, offline presence can go. 
but they're, they're a humorous way to explain, look, if you ran the Brody Food Mart and now it's the Dye Mart or, or the I'm Hurt Emergency and Trauma Center, you should really fix that offline presence. And what's amazing to us is most small business owners immediately get this principle. They're sort of like, hey, I, I know I've got to fix this. What, what is fascinating, though, is they don't necessarily really grasp just how important online presence is and that it has far surpassed offline presence. Gone are the days where people drove around aimlessly looking for a tailor or looking for that yogurt shop and hoping to see your signage. It does help for impetus buy, so it's important, but most people are now checking their phone and saying, where can I get a cup of yogurt, where can I get um, a, a hot tea? That's happening online, and it's happening predominantly because mobile is driving us that way. So how do you explain to someone how important this is? Well, one way is to ask uh, the all-important God goal. Right? So if you went to Google right now and typed in, uh, and I, you're more than welcome to do this, uh, uh, if, if you find some funny answers or comments, throw them in the q and I love seeing what people see when they type it in. But if you type in, why did my business into Google, uh, you will see in the world's largest correlation engine, which is what Google's autocomplete or autosuggest is, it figures out what are the, the, the most likely things you're looking for, right? Well, usually by the time you get to the I in business, it will show you something like this. Why did my business disappear from Google Maps? And then, kind of not humorously, but amazingly, the very next thing is, why did my business fail? What you see there is in the highest correlation engine on the planet, which takes into account not only what people are asking it, but what they're clicking. So the actual follow through is how the engine works. It has found a direct and highest correlation between the actual failure offline of any business and the fact that it disappeared from Google Maps. So what it's trying to tell us is your online presence is absolutely critical to your offline presence. Uh, and, and that direct correlation for most, most business and merchants is a critical issue that they don't really fully grasp yet. So let's get into uh, what is online presence then. Well, it's really four different things. Uh, and and it's, it, it's a digital footprint. Um, it's, it's, but it's not just your website, right? And, and those that utilize HubShot understand there's so many components to this. Um, but generally speaking, we, we kind of talk it as sort of a four-legged stool. The website, the directory listings, and search engine listings, kind of grouping those together. Your social presence, and then reviews of your business. You know, each one of these is very different, and they require different levels of attention. At Yext, we, we principally start with the directory listings and the search engine listings because we're all about syndicating the perfect information into every hand, no matter where someone looks for you. But over the last uh, year, we have focused very, very closely with partnerships like HubShout to figure out how could we integrate more tools into the process. And what that it, it resulted in is that we also touch upon reviews, notification about reviews, social presence, and even a little bit of tools around the website. But all of it really depends on a digital marketer, typically a professional, helping the small business understand these four legs of the stool and then building a proper balanced diet in it to ensure that they are being found appropriately. So, so let's, let's, let's take a look uh, at um, some facts around this. Um, as I said earlier, consumers are searching more and more for businesses online. 63% um, use at least two devices to do this. Uh, I, we've all been sort of watching how the, uh, the, uh, the increase in number of searches uh, on mobile is surpassed desktop, you're going to see a lot more of that. And the numbers for local are even higher. But then you get into things like 72% trust online reviews. Um, social is becoming a massive boost in this. Um, and 54% substituting their yellow pages search uh, in a phone book with online. All of these things, 25 billion local searches annually, really start to drive us towards a big question, which is, yes, offline sales or online sales are important. But if you draw it out, we hear a lot about online sales, but still offline absolutely dwarfs e-commerce. So I know we just you know, finished up with uh, Cyber Monday, and they, they, they're trying to stretching it into Cyber Tuesday, uh, just like they were with Black Friday, is now starting on Thanksgiving. Um, it's pretty interesting to watch how these things work. But ultimately, when you break it down, online sales are still only 1 15th of offline sales. It is a massive differential. And you need for your clients to understand that to get this correct, you really want to make sure those offline sales, um, that people know where you are so they can transact with you. 
So yes, they're looking for you online, but they're, they're definitely um, hoping to find you offline. Any questions so far uh, as, as we're going through it I, I, before we get into some of these other data sets? I know the chat window is uh, pretty quiet. I've had a few things, but we've been chatting about, but no questions for you so far. Okay, great. This is all pretty straightforward, and, and before we get into the ecosystem stuff, um, but something that is pretty interesting, um, these metrics right here, 40% of in-person purchases include online research. Now, I can't see you, but normally at a conference, I would ask people in the audience, how many of you do online research before making a major purchase? I think this 40% is incredibly low. It's usually like 80 to 90% in the room. And in fact, if it's, if it's a digital marketing conference, I'm a little disappointed that 10% that don't raise their hand. Um, the reality is, is this is probably closer to 100% depending on the segment you're talking to. Um, what was fascinating, however, was the next statistic. 55% of purchase-related conversions can, uh, happening within an hour of initial mobile search. Now that makes sense when it's, when it's mobile search, right? So you ask, hey, where's this restaurant, where's this place? You're there within an hour buying. Uh, amazing, over half. Um, and then 76% of decisions. So even though people are looking for data online, I'm looking at, at Best Buy or an electronic store saying, you know, let me look at the new, uh, uh, new phone I'm interested in buying, but I'm still going to go there three out of four times to actually purchase locally. Um, these are really important metrics for each of our partners and each of their clients. So when we said being found online is absolutely critical, um, these are the things that we're talking about, right? So your website, directory listings, social reviews, all of these things, not only do they have to be there, but you can optimize each one. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in best practices, but our goal will ultimately be to explain to people, the more you fill out this information, the better. And we, and we tell people, you know, what are the keys to success? Well, keys to success are, are things like, look, you've got to be found. You've got to be online. Make sure that your presence is there. Um, it's not just about fixing errors. It's about keeping the data correct. We're going to talk about this in the next section on local search and then further on the local search ecosystem. But it's not enough to, to hope that you've fixed it or sort of hope and pray that it's done. It's a whole different thing to ensure that the data stays correct. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about duplicate listings, too, and why they're so important to the, the ecosystem and, and, unfortunately, a virus to the health of the ecosystem. Um, next, we tell people be engaged. Being engaged is not just about uh, hopping on the latest social trend or Twitter account and conversing. Being engaged is about making yourself stand out online. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, people remember. I, 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 I'm always amazed when I go to Craigslist that it's still that great 1987 technology that, that built it to begin with. But on Craigslist, there's a little button that says, has photos. Uh, and when you buy something, it's kind of funny that you actually have to tell Craigslist, hey, can you show me the stuff with photos first? Uh, when you do that, it's a different user experience. Most systems at this point optimize for showing customers the listings or the data around businesses where their most information is available. Why? Because information is liquidity. Information is what we actually are buying. We're buying into, okay, I've learned enough. I know where this place is. It looks good. The reviews are good. The products that I want are there. The, they have the car that I'm interested in stock. All of that type of data is what drives sales. So ultimately, the more engaged you are by sharing the data and information around your business, the more likely that it's going to work. Um, the last one's kind of hokey, but it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of true, too, which is great to be found, great to be engaged. We also tell them as small business owners and, and professionals, please be nice. Uh, it is amazing, uh, literally, even this weekend, I was cleaning up a friend's website who was being held hostage by their digital marketer uh, because they just wanted to make some updates to the menu. You know, it's important to always remember that when dealing with small businesses and small businesses dealing with their community, um, that you got to be nice. You got to stay as uh, engaged as possible. But um, remember that your reputation is very hard to fix. Uh, ask anyone who's suffering from a Yelp uh, blowout. So those, that's the basic premise around what online presence is. It's not that hard to describe. And usually when we show people those offline broken neon signs, by the way, if you Google funny neon signs, uh, I highly recommend you're careful because uh, I have probably the four most tame ones you're going to see. Uh, but I will tell you, um, it is an important thing to explain to small businesses. And it's something that once they understand it, 
the next step as a, as a sales tool is typically to show them a scan of the information in the ecosystem about their business. Uh, before we get to that, uh, I'm going to jump into local search. Not sure if there's any other questions at this point, but if not, I can keep going. All right, I will keep going. Um, so how do we handle local search? And I, I can't tell you the number of sort of disparate uh, models out there about how people believe local search works, but I'm going to walk you through the most simple way to explain it to a business, but also really to understand it from what is Yext providing as part of the service uh, that we work with with PubShout. And one of the funny things about Yext is it was not designed to solve this problem. It just happens to be really good at solving it. And really what it is is when I, uh, I live in New Jersey, uh, so if I wanted to drive into the city and go to a new pizzeria that uh, I had heard about, Goodfellas Pizzeria, uh, in order to do that, um, I ask 10 people whom I trust that live in New York and live in the Lower East Side, and they're all foodies, so I know I can ask them uh, you know, a, a question, hopefully about a restaurant that they'll know. And if I ask 10 people um, where Goodfellas Pizzeria is, and I get something like this, where it says, um, the first person says, here's where it is. The next one says, agreed, yep, perfect, exactly. If all 10 people who I trust perfectly agree as to where the location is, then I have pretty high confidence. I'm going to you know, load up the family in the minivan and drive through the tunnel and, and, and go try this place out, right? The, the difference here is, now imagine if instead the, the answers kind of look like this, which is, do you mean brick oven? Because it's different than the pizzeria, and I don't even know if they do pizza. Um, or Archer Street, or it's a slightly different phone number, or if the fifth person goes where, that's a big problem. That in real life, forget about the algorithms for a second, in real life there is absolutely no way I'm loading up the, the minivan and driving into New York to go to this place. Forget about what it says online. If the 10 people I trust can't even agree whether or not this is a, a reference to a movie or a restaurant, that's not a great situation for success, right? So I have low confidence in this. This results in lost business. It lowers rank in search because this is ultimately how local search is based. It's not to say that there aren't other factors, but let's, let's break down what are the three most important factors in search. First, consistency. When we were asking our 10 people about where a place was, the consistency was the single most important factor that we looked at. We wanted to make sure that the 10 people that we trusted um, did in fact say the exact same name, address, phone. Now, interestingly, many humans are superb at pattern recognition and breaking down an understanding, making leaps from one object to another. Computers still aren't so good at that. So when you have a computer that looks at a series of data points, and one says Goodfellas Pizza, the next says Goodfellas, the next says Goodfellas LES, the next says Goodfellas Brick Oven, computers cannot make the same level of leap that others can. When you compound that with wrong phone numbers or old data about addresses, you really start to confuse the computer. Not to say that a human might still not take a leap of faith, but generally speaking, why would a search engine return something that it had lower confidence in when they could return five other pizza joints where it had perfect confidence in it? And that's a big structure. That's a big thing. So what's the second thing? The authority. Remember I said I was talking about 10 people who lived in the Lower East Side where this place was, and it had, they were foodies? These are people that I trust. Why? Because they have domain authority. They have expertise. And that's exactly what the search engines also look at. You've heard this before. So consistency, authority of the sites, and then number. We want a large quantity. In fact, 10 is OK. Uh, and I think we started the Power Listings Network here at Yex with 12. Uh, but it's grown substantially. And if you ask who does you know, Google ask, who are the 10 sources or more that they, that they focus on, well, it's, it's, it's essentially these types of shops, right? So Facebook, Yahoo, Factual, Yelp, Local, Tupelo, um, uh, Bing. It's looking at, and it's funny, Google Plus is actually listed here. It's, it's treated as Google as a separate data input, which uh, many of you may, may have seen in some of the results as you uh, build out Google Plus profiles. But ultimately, the goal here is to make sure that these sources, and we have 47 additional in, in addition to these, perfectly match, they are authoritative, and they have a large number. Now, how do, how do we choose who's authoritative and who has a large number? It, it's not just about uh, unique visitors. That is important. Obviously, Facebook, Yahoo, Bing, Yelp, tons of visitors. That is authority. 
But remember, that's not the only thing that has authority uh, to Google. The way that they mark up their data. So uh, I'll laugh uh, at, at, with, with, with people about, um, they go through our list of publishers, and they're like, why do you have you know, topics or, or Tupelo or um, who's something like Easy Local? They're not big. They're not huge. And what we point out to them is they may not be, but if you look up a local business in Google, you'll be amazed at how many slots on the first page those types of directories return. And to a large degree, it's because their data is marked up very, very cleanly. Uh, and the Googlebot likes that and enjoys uh, crawling sites where schema.org or microformats are utilized to parse the data in a very machine-readable format. That's another thing that we should look at. But ultimately, in the end, I just hope this makes sense as a logical thing. It's a consistency in trusted sources, and it really isn't operating any differently than me calling 10 friends that live in the city and asking about a restaurant. Um, that said, that's really what we refer to as local SEO. There's also, as you know, uh, a, a, a massive science around what I refer to more as classic SEO, so on-page stuff, blogs. Um, who, what, do, what do your, your, your tags you know, your tags and your H1 headers look like? Are you really getting all the keywords properly? Um, is it original content? Have you borrowed content from out, uh, other ways, to put it nicely? There's lots of other things that can greatly affect your SEO, but when it comes to a local business, predominantly in local search, it's really about these three factors, consistency, authority, and number. So looking at a, a live scan here, um, this is that actual Goodfellas Pizzeria, um, which very humorously, I don't think the slide made it into the, uh, into the shot, but we had a, uh, we had a partner um, go down and go to Goodfellas Pizzeria in New York recently. And uh, funny, on, it's on the corner. And uh, on one side of the, of the business, the neon sign says Goodfellas LES, which you'll see here is, is uh, on Bing the way it's listed, Goodfellas LES. On the other side, um, the, um, the F is out in the neon sign. Uh, so life imitating art uh, humorously for us. But, so it says Good Ella's. LES, uh, which is funny because we'll see that work into the uh, into the ecosystem soon enough, I'm sure. Uh, but it was just hilarious to us that the the, the pizzeria that we've been using for years in demonstration uh, actually also has an offline presence problem. So we have photos of it. Um, th what what this shows you though is uh, this is a typical scan um, utilizing uh, our tools uh, made available through HubShout of of scanning information. Um, and 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 really what it does is we put in the name, address, phone. And what you'll see is things like missing listings. So for example, these guys don't have a Facebook account that we could identify. And what's really different about Yext is we do not crawl these sites. Yext is specifically and pays for access across these different types of sites for custom APIs for us to hit their database. Um, the problem with crawling is, number one, it's transient and it's cached, meaning it's hard to get it right. The crawls change a lot. And when you cache or store the data, it too changes and you have to redo it. What we've done is we pay these partners uh, to give us custom APIs. We pay them for the implementation so that we have a suite of access points for a business through partners like, like you to be able to go in and get an understanding of what does this look like. So is the phone number right everywhere? Uh, is, is the address wrong? And Goodfellas has a trouble with their name. You'd be amazed what you see when you put a doctor in here, uh, doctors that were part of one practice and then part of another practice. Um, it's amazing how many data inconsistencies there are. And as we said just a little while ago, that's really principally affecting their local search results, very much hurting them, uh, and very hard to fix if you don't take control of this data. And so you can see down here the last bullet, no control. It's real hard for good fellows to go one by one at each one of these and hope to fix this information. It's instead, at Yext, what we do is, by working with these, these publishers, we take control of the information, uh, which will lead me into my next section uh, about the local data ecosystem and how data works, so you can really get a sense of how is Yext different than all the other tools out there. So my former company at InfoGroup, or Locallys, or Moz, which is a composite of, of, of those and two others, how do, those, how do those really differ? And the, the main way is, number one, we take control of the data, uh, we, we fix the data, but then we also lock down the data. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you that in the next section. But any questions on how local search works 
And, and again, I, I would recommend if, if, if you go to Moz's forums, uh, the great, great um, uh, uh, use for professionals, they have a whole series and an annual search factors on local uh, uh, study that's done by David Mim and the team there to do a great job. But it's usually really focused on consistency, authority, and number. It changes in rank, um, but it's one of those things of it's sort of the baseline. You've got to get it right. And while you can go manually or you can go through data aggregators, we'll talk through what are the differences and why does that matter. Um, hey, any hey, questions on how local search? Yeah. Christian, it's Chad. I, I just had a couple of things because actually you hit on one of the questions that we had actually a couple of people ask um, prior in, in the lead up to the webinar. Um, but I wanted to first go back to in large numbers. Um, so I think the, what is the number now? It's 50, I, I don't, it's in the 50s is the number of partners you have. But yeah, it's about see, 58. Yeah, so we see a lot, you know, uh, other vendors out there who essentially offer, let me go build you 300 citations. Um, or actually, it seems like they offer an unlimited number of, of places they can, they claim they can, um, you know, cite your business. And one of the things that um, I guess I was curious on is just, you know, when what is the right number and when does the authority of one of those citations um, drop off? Like, I mean, how do you guys think about that when you're, you're deciding should you go get another 10 partners or stick with 58 and build out more features with those 58? Yep, that's a, it's a great question, and we do we, we actually have a team here that's specifically and only focused on analyzing publishers. Um, so as you probably would guess, um, the world sort of knows that we pay publishers to do these integrations and to give us control. Uh, it's what has let's just say it gets them to focus on the problem of of that faces small businesses. So we take the money that small businesses provide to us, chop it into pieces, and give it to the publishers to to build up that level of control. That's the whole model. So we get publishers out of the woodwork saying, hey, add me to the network. I want to be involved. I'd love to make a little money. Um, so it, it's really common. We have probably reviewed literally thousands of publishers globally at this point. And we whittle it down by analyzing and running um, a massive number of searches in different categories, on different businesses, business types. We do that to figure out who really is driving um, or, or resulting in uh, results for the individual business. So let me, let me, let me start with the, the beginning of the question of, you know, what number is the right number? I can honestly tell you I don't know. I can tell you that the best way to come at this is for every business, every geography, every category, there is probably a slightly different answer to that. I can tell you for an attorney, for example, um, we have many partners where they will use the Net Yext network to get the, the biggest uh, sites that cover the most ground, but then they'll also still do the legal directories, so lawyer.com and um, fine law and some of the others, they'll do those too, right? Because it's very important in that level of a competitive spend market to optimize some of those uh, vertical directories. At Yex, we, we made a decision specifically actually after talking to our partners uh, to a large degree to not necessarily go after those vertical directories. Why? Well. In some cases, we really think that's what you guys do best. We think it's what a professional needs to do, which is work with the, the client in their vertical and optimize for them. What we plan on doing is we work with them on how they use Yext. Uh, for example, like I was saying with the legal, legal entities, they, uh, interestingly, most of our partners with great success in the lawyer vertical, they don't first ask the lawyer what their name is, their address, and their phone number is. That's sort of the classic data thing. They come in first with, what's your biography? Tell me about your firm. Tell me about the attorneys there. They use Yext along with these other vertical directories to syndicate really rich content about the attorneys and about the, the details of where they've worked, what, what accolades they hold, et cetera. So there's different answers based on different verticals. We spend a lot of time trying to cover the, the vast majority of what we think you should do. I, I can't really say whether or not, like at White Spark, I know Darren Shaw um, and uh, Nyagislav uh, work very closely with companies to get all the way down to sponsoring the local church's 5K so that they'll put your name on the calendar of the event and then they count that as a citation. Look, to be honest, that might work great. It, it might be great in a rural area to go that deep into building a citation. Um, I would tell you the vast majority of our partners don't really go much further than Google because you have to claim that yourself. There's no, there's no getting around it. You've got to take care of that yourself. And yes, um, and then if it's a real 
a specific vertical, they might add a few verticals. Um, I have not seen many people building uh, strong, sustained businesses on, you know, adding the, you know, the 80th or the 200th uh, um, citation. Uh, that said, when we go into the next section about how the local data ecosystem works, don't assume just because you're only doing yet that your citations aren't still getting out to hundreds of other sites, because as I'll demonstrate, that's exactly what does happen. Um, but it's just a matter of do you proactively try to do it or not. I would say to your partners uh, here on the phone, it's really up to you. If you feel like it's in a rural area or geography dictating a reason to do it, or if the category is super competitive, then I think you, you could absolutely add a few vertical directories if it's going to help. Um, but to a large degree, I, I take care of the Google. Uh, that, that's got to happen uh, first or second. Um, and then I'd utilize Yext to take control and perfectly clean up the 58 sites. Then see where you stand. Um, we, we have many partners within five weeks. They can see listings that were nowhere near page one moving up in the ranks. Obviously, we don't, we don't pitch Yext as an SEO product, but we know that it does help to clean all this up and get perfectly consistent data out to the ecosystem, uh, which I'll cover in a minute. Great. But, sorry, I don't have a perfect answer for you. No, no, that's that's a great answer. It's a great answer. And then I guess the other part of my question, um, and I think it sounds like it may be able to save it for the ecosystem, but I do want to make sure that people, will you be showing people what the difference between Moz, what Moz Local, because that is sort of a new product and Moz has got a great brand, what the difference between what Moz Local is doing and what, Yax does in terms of some of this control and relationship you guys have? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, uh, David Mim, who um, was, you know, getlisted.org prior to this, uh, I was still at Infogroup when we started pulling together the contracts to do it. Um, I, I, I think it's a very good data submission product, and I'll point out that there, there are lots of data submission products. Um, but let's, you know, for a minute just talk about the difference between submission and control. Um, I want everybody on the call to go over to Google and, and Google define submission. Believe me, it's nothing you want to do. Um, in the end, you don't want to submit the data to the will of everyone else, and that's exactly, as I'll show in a second, what happens with submission products. Um, but again, you also got to kind of look at each client. I can't tell you that putting out data through a submission product doesn't help. It could but it often causes a lot of other problems. And I'll jump into the local search ecosystem now so we can, we can sort of take a look at them. Um, so the local search ecosystem. This is my favorite, one of my favorite topics because I've been on sort of all sides of this. Uh, and, and everyone, I'm sure, is familiar with this map. So if you haven't seen this map before, um, this is pretty common. Uh, I like to call it the pit of spaghetti um, off of uh, uh, um, you know, basically you look at it and sort of like, wow, there's a lot of lines here. Um, what I would say to you is, is the big problem with this is people say, I'm going to fix your online presence. Um, and I can do it by referencing and, and navigating the complexities of this map. Um, that's, a, that's horribly inaccurate. <laughs> so when it comes to fix, okay, what I want you to understand is the thickness and the thinness of these lines really don't matter. They don't matter to Google, they don't matter to the data providers, and they certainly don't matter to the individual directories. The concept of this was always how can we show a lot of the players that we know are important, but what it doesn't really say is, okay, if every one of these all had the same thickness arrow, and David Mim and I have had the, the debate on this many times, it's a great who's who of the ecosystem, but it actually really doesn't show how it works. See, the ecosystem itself underneath this, you have to go to every single one of these publishers and every one of these data providers, like Infogroup or Axiom or Newstar, Localese, right? You've got to go to all of these and look at how they compile data. And the best way to explain it is to look at it this way. Um, and this is going to be a sports reference, so I apologize up front, but it doesn't have to be just about sports. But if you look at this small business, okay, Let's say I am Yahoo, and I'm trying to publish a directory of all the businesses in the United States. Well, I need to know what the name of this business is. Forget about the address and the phone. Let's just start with the name of Goodfellas, right? Well, I can go to literally thousands of sources to find the name of the business. Some of the sources are ones like these. My own user reviews, Google Places data, Facebook posts, Twitter posts, regional directories like, uh, you know, the South Carolina First Directory, whatever it may be. Dex Knows is a great directory that people will go to. 
claimed Yelp listings, Foursquare check-ins. Then there's a whole nother side of the pie, right? Government filings. When this business first set up, it walked into a bank, or the person that started it walked into a bank. They set up their bank account. That bank account, when they set it up, um, I don't know if you guys have ever, if, when you started your business, if you recall, when you set that up, you know how you get the checks in the mail? Well, that comes from a company called Deluxe. Deluxe sets up several hundred thousand of those a year where they have name, address, phone. What's the problem with that? Well, a lot of times when you start your business and get the checking account, you haven't leased the space yet where the business is going to go. Guess where that address and name and phone number go? They get sold. That data makes its way back into the ecosystem and is constantly coming back up. It's the same data on the tax form, so your Secretary of State forms, your health inspection form. This stuff just keeps coming up. It's sort of like the kid that should never have uploaded a photo that they probably shouldn't have to Facebook, uh, that it never goes away. Well, data does the same thing no matter what the data is of. And what you end up with is at Yahoo, when they're trying to figure out the name of this business, really what it is, it's March Madness brackets. It's essentially the exact same process at every publisher, except always different teams playing and always different outcomes. And what you will see is they have something like this where different sources will trump other sources. So they might have a Twitter post review that can, or Twitter post that comes out, uh, let's say, yesterday, Trump and Angie's list review from six months ago. Why? Because recency is very important to data. If the data isn't recent, people stop trusting it. In fact, when I was at InfoGroup, this bracket is incredibly um, basic for really the amount of data that they pull in. I think people don't quite understand just how big a job data aggregators have. You're talking about 30 million businesses where there are literally a vast multiple, greater than that, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of data points every day trying to vie for control of what the name of this business is in a file that's then shipped out to publishers. So it's a very complex process, and I, want, I know everybody wants to believe it should just operate and work well. It doesn't. In fact, I could sit with you with any one of your clients, take out my mobile phone, sit in the cafe of your client with you and systematically shut down all of the data or change the phone number of the cafe within minutes by just opening 15 to 20 location-aware apps on my iPhone. So I can open Apple Maps and Google Maps and Facebook and Foursquare and then uh, Dex's uh, uh, directory system, uh, YP's directory system, all of these. Then I can post five tweets with different addresses and phone numbers for the business all of that is being crawled, used, and resubmitted in this process. It is a never-ending story, and it's really a pain in the neck. Now, that's a lot to take in. I don't know if there's any questions on that yet, but that is how it works, and there's one other really interesting thing about this, which is this section here, for example, is controlled by a guy, let's call him Peter, at a particular firm. This section over here is controlled by a gal named Sally at a, a, a particular firm. When Peter goes on vacation and Sally covers for him, she has a different process than he has. So you will actually even see human interaction affect how the, the ultimate sandwich is made because the data comes in at different times from different sources. So if you, if you wanted to look this up, you can Google why did my business listing change, um, how come my Google Maps listing changed. All of this comes from a process we call compilation. And when compilation gets screwed up or compilation isn't sure, bad things happen to data. That's why going back to the original uh, diagram, you can see it's a very confusing one, and there's a lot of people and a lot of smart minds trying to fix this. I can firmly tell you no one has gotten it right. And it's why you have to deal with this on an ongoing basis. Now, let's talk a little bit about aggregators. Now, after you look up submission and control, I want you to look up the word aggregator. It absolutely is not a source. So if we go into something that like Factual, Axiom, Infogroup, and Localease, I hope everyone on the phone will appreciate the acronym. The reality is it doesn't work. And why does it not work? Well, the reason why these submission to these types of products, and this is really what Moz does, it's not that you can't get the data in there, but they're not the source. An aggregator is an aggregator of sources, right? So unless factual, axiom, infogroup, and localese, 
can also get the federal government to let them change the data in the source file at the federal government, meaning the Secretary of State form from 20 years ago, that data is not under their control. They are not the source. They are just pulling it in from lots of places. And what is happening now is people go to them and want to blame them for the data not being right. Part of the process, and again, I think InfoGroup is a phenomenal company. We're partnered with them here at Yet. I, I, I think each of these factual is in our, our power listings network. You have to understand what their business model is. See, at InfoGroup or at Factual or any of these shops, they walk into a big publisher and they say, I want you to buy my records of 30 million records, 30 million businesses just in the United States, and I'm so confident in my data. My data is 20% more accurate than localizes. Well, an hour and a half later, localize walks into the same office. And they say, we've got 30 million records. And boy, can I tell you how much quality they are. We're 25% more accurate than InfoGroup and Locally's. Or they were Locally's, sorry, and, and Axiom and, and InfoGroup. The reality is, when you realize they all disagree on averages from 15 to 25% across their data files, guys, 20% of, of 30 million records is 6 million business listings that they don't agree on. Consider what that's doing to the ecosystem. They're pumping out the data, and ultimately, since the small business through Moz or Direct, you know, you've got to remember, Moz has rolled up, when, when you want to ask the differences, they've rolled up this submission process, but it's still free to small businesses, typically, to go to these individuals as the small business and submit. You have to now pay these shops if you want to do it as a professional, because they've turned it into a business model. But in the end, their business is really selling data by the pound. It is not in ensuring that the business itself or the digital marketer on their behalf is the one in control of the data. So how does this all happen? Well, let's, let's take a look at um, a, a, sort of a fun view of that, of that ecosystem. And I, I, I want to just point out again this last bullet, which is when people say fix it at the source and they, they say fix it at factual axiom info group and localese, I want you to mail them a, a Merriam-Webster dictionary. Because the word aggregator is not in any way a source. Many of the aggregators try to be source files, but that's not really where the data is coming from. The data is actually aggregated from March Madness brackets, and it truly is madness. So how could we look at it another way? Well, being the total geek that I am, I couldn't help it after talking with David and others in the marketplace. I said, well, listen, if we all want to use this map, that's fine. But the arrows don't really mean anything because the reality is when Google crawls city search, that doesn't necessarily count for less than them getting a file from an info group. And when Facebook crawls YP, it doesn't necessarily have an arrow there either. What you have to understand is all of these things are ultimately players or coaches or water boys in that March Madness brackets of teams playing for data. It's all different. Um, further, all of those sources are now using crawled data so it's getting even harder. And I, I can demonstrate later for the, for the group how this creates duplicates, uh, which is something we'll talk about. But I thought, what if we took this diagram, and instead of looking at the flat arrows, to me, it's actually much more of a three-dimensional thing. So I took the diagram and started slicing it into a three-dimensional design, where if you could separate all the actors into a different view, what would it look like? Um, now, I'm not sure on WebEx if this will actually even be able to get there, but what I was doing is I took the data and sliced it up into three segments because really there's only three different types of things here going on. Either you go direct to the publishers and manually try and change the data, which means you have to worry about the crawls and other, other direct submissions, or you go to the aggregators, which is um, principally, as you can see here, facts, factual, locally, infogroup, and, and axiom, or you could skip all of those things and go to the only platform that literally takes control of the data in real time, locks out all the rest of the competing data sources in March Madness, and ensures that you have real time access to the data through one dashboard, and that's YEC. So the main difference here is that control, as far as I'm concerned, and most of my partner's clients are concerned, that is the most important thing. I was helping um, one of my friends who has a restaurant uh, in Hoboken, New Jersey uh, this weekend with their website. And as I was doing it, I, I actually have never signed them up for EX. I ran a scan, and this other restaurant called Black Tea Optional was everywhere for this place in directories. 
So there were duplicates with the same phone number, and same address, but different business name. And uh, as I asked, I, I didn't know this, but I asked our, my friend who runs it and owns the place, why, is there, why are there two? He said, oh, wow, that's really funny. We, we actually, before we named it Autostrada, we, we, we named it Black Tea Optional. And I, get, I guess I filled out some stuff that had that. That's how this happened. Because he put data, or someone did on his behalf, into a publisher directly or into a data aggregator. Now, let's quickly talk about how this creates duplicates. Um, I would tell you, if you want to use submission data, I, I, I won't say that you shouldn't do it. I, I guess I would say, let's consider the warnings, which is you really have to understand that when the, pub, the aggregators themselves want to um, compete with other aggregators and sell files, they do it based on quality. Remember, if they all had exactly the same data, they'd have to charge the same for it, and their business model would collapse. So when they sell data by the pound, they want to make sure that it's differentiated, and they typically use quality or a difference in the data to represent that. What that means is, when you give your data to Moz Local, number one, it's not real time. Number two, it will not take control of the data. Number three, you should expect six to nine months before really seeing a lot of results, except I think they have four or five publishers that they send data to directly. I don't know uh, how they do that if it's API or if it's a file, but that still isn't control of those listings. It's just a submission. When that happens, you're essentially paying to give the data to people that will then pump it out to the ecosystem. That's the theory. Unfortunately, what you're not understanding is when you do that, you have InfoGroup now has the data record, Axiom has the record, Localese has the record, and Factual has the record. Remember when I said earlier that they compete with each other? Well, they change the data as they clean it themselves. It's never under your control. You don't get to lock them out from changing it. What does that lead to? What well, leads to black key, key optional and autostrata because one of the aggregators gets one set of data and the other aggregators do their own research and say, oh, no, no, it's no longer black key. It's actually, it's now autostrata. We're going to change it. You're creating duplicates in the ecosystem because when you hand data to aggregators and they compete, they basically are guaranteeing that the data will probably be different. And in fact, if you go to the frequently asked questions for Moz Local, this is up on their own forum, I, 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 it, it points out that Axiom and Localese, I want to say, in particular, specifically state that when you stop working with them through Moz or Direct, they're going to revert the data and instantly cause duplicates on it with the next file they put out. You have to understand that duplicates are a massive problem in the ecosystem. They confuse Google to no end in terms of where is this actual business. And it's something that um, we actually spent a, the better part of this year building a duplicate suppression system. And we were close to launching hookups with aggregators because we already have factual. And our rule was we would never launch an aggregator submission platform if we didn't in first, in fact, have a phenomenal duplicate suppression system. Because as soon as you start sending data out through multiple aggregators, you're just begging for the data ecosystem to be corrupted. So, Hopefully that explains a little bit of the differences, but ultimately the most important thing is it's sort of control versus submit, uh, and, and they are as they, as they are defined. Um, let, me, let me show you one other way to think about it, because I, I find it funny. We, we, uh, at YEX, sometimes we get um, this uh, uh, comment, uh, well, you guys are just an overlay. You're, you're, you're just sort of, you're not fixing the problem. Again, you, you, you really can't fix the problem. The problem started in 1978 when the first yogurt shop opened up and they gave the wrong address or a different address to the lock. It goes on and on. But what I would say to you is, is, in fact, the only way to solve the problem is to lock it and take control of it. So if you were to look at how local data works, look at it this way. A publisher, so forget about InfoGroup and Axiom and Localese right now. Now let's talk about the publisher. The publisher will take hundreds of sources or more they will take the name and they will choose one person who is going to rank the highest in the name. And in this case, they chose the government record. I could give you a million reasons why that's a horrible idea, but let's say they chose the government record, right? For the address, they chose Localese. For the phone, they chose InfoUSA. And for um, the website, they used web crawling, which is also a horrible idea. But nonetheless, this is how it works. Well, they end up with this, what we call a Franken file. It's basically parts of a lot of other bodies that create your listing. This is the danger here, which is you'd have to go through and find every possible entity 
and go in and make sure they all not only had the data you wanted them to have, but kept the data as you have it, which you can't do. It's, it's not only theoretically impossible, it's mathematically and combinatorially impossible. Um, so if we go to the next slide, waiting, okay. So now we have also a spray and pray approach. This is, well, I'll try and get it to as many places as possible. So I'm going to use Moz or I'm going to go direct to the aggregators or I'll use any number one of these other sources who I, I wrote the contracts with at, well, that info group and say, hey, if I fix it with you guys, you're good enough. I'll spray it with you. you we'll, we'll get this covered. The problem is it happens again. You're just, you don't have control of this and you will find you're actually going to create even more headaches down the road. Now, you might say maybe that's not my problem, that's the client's problem, but realistically, you're trying to fix it while they are your client and lock it so you can improve upon it, right? It's not just about, let me try and sort of hope, pray, and, and, and guess. It's, can I control it? Not only if I control it, can I leverage it, right? It's not just about the name, address, phone. Can I get their biography in there? Can I get their menu in there? Can I get reviews about them out there? Can I, can I use social syndication to help them? What can I do to improve everything around the client? Well, at Yext, it's different, right? At Yext, when we attach to a publisher, we trump all other sources. They all essentially go to NA, not, not available, not applicable. Um, and we now have the one record that you control on behalf of your client trumping everything else. Does that make sense? Is there any questions on, on that, that process? It makes a lot of sense. I don't know, Adam, if we, yeah, if we have any other questions there. I, I do have some questions from earlier on, so um, if you're ready for those, I can hit you with them, but they're not, they're not exactly on this process here. Oh, no, it's okay. Well, why don't I keep going, and we'll, if it's from the other section, we'll, we'll get to those in just a minute, but um, uh, I just, I'll quickly go through a couple other things. I know I've gone a long time, but I did read your questions up front. Um, people do ask us, okay, well, what is the, what's the network? It's great that you guys trump and you, you take control of all these. Here's a listing of all of the sites that we power. Uh, I would point out that most of these sites are real time. It's one of the absolute beautiful things about this is if you have somebody that says, you know, uh, uh, Christian, I appreciate you uh, handling our marketing. Can you go ahead and close us? We're going to, we're going to have holiday hours. Uh, so we're not going to be around from the 24th to the 28th, but, um, you know, put a nice message and change the hours. We can do that with Yext across this entire network in literally sub-second. Um, now, some of them will take longer, but the majority, the vast majority, sub-second, which means you can really start to leverage this presence in whole new ways that maybe you've never utilized before. A um, couple other things um, in terms of uh, the, the, use, the use of the practice or best practices. Um, there's also uh, the ability to do better content. So we often talk to people about make sure you're doing detailed business listings. What some people don't realize about what you guys have through HubShout is we can do all sorts of additional things, all the photos, all the menus, all the biographies, calendars of events, all of that can be powered through here. So you want to fill out these profiles as much as you can. You want to make sure that you maximize your categories. Categories cannot say enough about them. Um, at Yex, we track over 17,000 different categories and map them for you. But what many don't know is that at Yex, you can add up to 10 categories. Whereas when you go direct to a business uh, or to a publisher, a lot of times you can only get three. So we really help you maximize that. And as we all know in local search, category is usually how people are looking for something. We'll say Hoboken Italian restaurant. And we can make sure that that maps appropriately. Add the menus, products, services, bios, stay, uh, connect all the social posting tools. There's just a lot of benefit and different tools that you can utilize here. So we don't have a ton of time left. Why don't, why, don't I, why don't I turn it over to you for some questions and see if we can't cover anything else that I've missed. All right. Thanks, Christian. Uh, this, this first one um, says, other than the citation sites that Yex provides, what additional geo-specific citation sites should a small business be generating as links? So this goes back a bit to the conversation Christian, you and Chad were having earlier about how many uh, you were talking about vertical specific. This is more geo specific, and maybe even a question more for Chad or to take offline. Um, I think our answer, Chad, is you know we we like the diversification of if you have something hyper local. You know, getting citations and links hyper local is always a good idea. It's a pattern buster. But I don't know if you, either of you have anything to add. Yeah, I, Chad. Um, I don't know if you wanted. I, I mean, I would comment that hyper local and getting all the way down to those, as I was saying before. It's interesting. I don't think that there is a perfect recipe. 
I would say that it a lot of times depends on the geography as well as the category vertical. So I, I, I'm a firm believer that if it is in a very competitive category, you've got to get some of those vertical directories. But you know, people ask a lot of times, what's the absolute best local marketing can do? I still got to tell you, it's probably uh, uh, buying the t-shirts for the local rec soccer league for the kids. It's amazing how much uh, uh, bandwidth you'll get from that type of thing. That's hyper local. If you can also get a local paper or some of these other real small, small businesses to do it, it can't hurt. I guess the bigger question will be is, are you really optimizing those and will those directories or listings let you do so? Um, but I, I, I would say it's one of those things, there's no science to say it's perfect, but it certainly can't hurt. Yeah, we, we agree. So sponsor the Little League team. You know, give to the bake sale at the church. Um, you know, these are these are good things to do, and they, they do pay back. Here's another one for you, uh, Christian. Er, earlier, you were showing the live scan tool, and a couple of people yeah. asked, is that is that something you can only see once you become a Yex customer, or is that something you have access to pre-sales where you could potentially show a prospect listings that they have missing or that are inconsistent? So. Um, Typically, the way that it works is there is a tool um, that SMBs utilize. I would not utilize that as a professional. Um, what we typically have done is we provide um, HubShout uh, uh, and others access to the tool so they can email it as their own direct to the client. And that scan also has the links. Um, you, you'll, you'll, uh, the way that we do it is we want the client, as you should, a lot of times clients will say to us something like, 90 errors, there can't be 90 errors. How is that possible? We say, well, here's a link to every one of the listings we found because that access on the back end to the APIs of all these partners lets us actually pinpoint the listing and the ID. Um, it's great. It's a, it's a great help because you'll every once in a while have a client who says, oh, I could do this myself. And your response should always be, I tell you what, I'm going to email you the scan results. It has a link to every one of these things that you should fix. Go ahead, get get to it, get started, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. I'll check on you in a couple months. Trust me, guys, they can't fix it. It's one of those things of even if you get lucky and you get fixed too, it's so difficult to do. Something that's really kind of a funny secret around here at Yext is people with a lower error rate sign up for Yext at a much higher rate than people with a really high error rate. And, and we finally figured out why it is. It's not because you know uh, they don't believe the high error rate. It's that they haven't tried to fix it yet. Those who have tried to fix their online listings and thus have some correct um, and have really worked hard at it, they sign up in much bigger numbers and bigger quantity because they understand how hard this is. They've tried once or twice before and they're just like, you know what, for the cost of what I get from this, I'd much rather a professional do this right. You, you take care of it and, and it's well worth the cost. And Adam, I'll connect the dots on that. There is a so we do have access to that tool. Um, there are some some questions that we have outstanding about white labeling capabilities. So maybe as a follow on, we can talk to Nicole and Christian about that and and see what types of um, options we have for incorporating that in to everyone's private labeled portals. Yeah, I think I think that's, that, that would be a great thing to do. Yeah. I think we should do that. I know Ben in particular wants the specifics on that. And for you know, for all those others who haven't yet um, you know seen our API integration, you know, there's great API integration that Yex got here has here. Then we have integration with our private label portal to get the summary of that. So if you haven't um, checked that out, you definitely should. Uh, it's excellent functionality, and the partnership's been going very strong. I think because in part of that as well as the capabilities. I think that uh, takes us right up to four o'clock, Chad. So the, if any other questions we didn't get to. Please feel free to uh, come to our 4 p.m. Q&A session or reach out to an account manager. We'd love to answer them for you. Yeah, and Christian, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. Um, this is fascinating. I, I remember you going through this with me, um, like I said, probably almost a year ago now. And, um, you know, I think it still is, is very much true. And I think really we, we came to you um, in very much the same position that you're saying with that sign-up rate. So it was true with us where we had been in the weeds trying to get all this stuff sorted out and just getting a lot of people coming back with you know, unhappy clients because things were not claimed or we claimed them and then the listings didn't work anymore. So we said, this is, this is for the birds. We've got to do this a different way. Um, and uh, you know, this, this has uh, been a, a great partnership so far, and we appreciate you coming today. And, Nicole, we appreciate you um, helping us set this up. So, um, again, thanks a lot. And, like, uh, like as, as always, we will post this in our, uh, on our website tomorrow for everyone to review. And have a great day.
Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, guys.